Hi everyone, welcome back to the podcast. Today I'm joined by my guest Isilsa E to talk about a few things. So initially we start off by talking about the biggest factors contributing to hormone health. She sees inflammatory foods, parasites, heavy metals and candida overgrowth being some of the most common risk factors. We talk about fibroids, which is something I haven't spoken about in detail. I have covered estrogen dominance a few times, so that will be definitely connected. But she talks about some symptoms of fibroids, the different types, causes and the treatment that she kind of guides her clients through. A salsa's approach to diet and why she recommends and, and kind of prescribes a plant-based diet, especially to her clients struggling with hormone imbalances. So that's obviously something that we differ on. We have a lot in common, but I promote more of an animal-based diet. So it's just very interesting to see. And um, she works a lot with um, African-American women. So maybe genetics play into that as well. But I yeah, love chatting about diet with her. And then finally, we finish up on discrimination and racism in medicine and also the health and wellness world and why a lot of um, people of colour are being overlooked or told they're insane or not getting the correct medical treatment they need, um, which is very sad to think. But she shares so many kind of scary stories and um, pretty horrifying um, statistics and things during the episode. So the links that she mentioned are in the episode show notes. I will read her bio now. So Isolsa E is also known as the raw girl of the raw girl.com. And she is a dynamic certified nutrition specialist, behavioral coach, host of the Staying Ageless podcast, which I am planning on being a guest on. I'm not sure when that's going to go live. So definitely check that out. And founder of Staying Ageless University. And she's a published author with 10 years of experience, inspiring others to live their best and healthiest lives. After completing her master's in nutrition and integrative health, Isolsa worked as a clinical nutritionist at a wellness center, where she provided nutritional coaching, meal planning, and offered a variety of dietary interventions to thousands of clients of all ethnicities and ages, with a variety of dietary preferences and suffering from a wide range of chronic conditions. Since then, Asalsa has created her signature online program, Staying Ageless 30 Plus, which has a comprehensive curriculum designed to help women age 30 plus achieve optimal health and stay youthful using diet and lifestyle changes. And the Raw Girls Hormone Balancing Academy, which is a healing program designed to holistically address fibroids, endometriosis, cysts, PCOS, and other hormone imbalances. So clients who have worked with Asalsa in groups and private coaching have lost hundreds of pounds, healed cystic and hormonal acne, achieved hormone balance pre and post menopause, had cancer down regulated, obviously we can't say cured or healed or anything, but um, yeah, you can definitely support cancer and reverse the um, process. Reverse nutritional deficiencies, pre-diabetes, diabetes, hypertension, so pretty much all of the chronic conditions that people struggle with these days. She helps them heal acne, skin issues through nutritional lifestyle interventions to enhance beauty and increase longevity. She offers candida and parasite cleansing and detox programs. Outside of her passion for health, it's also is an award-winning, globe-trotting producer and actress who's been featured in Glamour, Vogue, New York Times, Elle, Ebony, Black Enterprise, and more. So let's get straight into my interview with Esolsa. I'm sure you're going to love her just as much as I do. So welcome to the Hormones in Harmony podcast, Esolsa. It's lovely to chat with you today. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you so much for having me. And to start off with, I know I've just read your bio and that you've struggled with several different conditions. I would love to hear more about your health journey and um, how you eventually figured it out for yourself. Yeah, um, well, I decided to go vegan at the age of 13, which is very strange because I'm Nigerian American and Nigerians like meat. And so my parents thought I was crazy, but it, I felt really good. And I'm actually really glad I did because I was lactose intolerant. And now I know that if I hadn't, um, I would have ended up with some serious health issues. I already had sort of bad periods at some point. And then when I changed my diet, that changed as well. And I felt better. I wasn't getting migraines as bad cramping, et cetera. So I was vegan for a while. And then when I got to college, um, still vegan, but eating a lot of processed food. Um, so was getting sick a lot and started to have some skin issues, went to visit a cousin in Los Angeles, of course, LA, um, who, uh, her and this actress friend who I really respected were both raw foodists and they were like, she was like 30, but everyone thought she was in college. I mean, she was super inspiring. 
And they were like, you should, you know, you should eat more raw food. You should eat more salads, eat more, you know. So they were just getting me like thinking about eating more in that manner. And then after college, that's when the ish hit the fan. I started getting really tired all the time. The acne got out of control. And I was also in front of the camera a lot, um, doing some modeling work, some acting work. And it was really nerve wracking to have like horrible skin while you're supposed to be on camera. And everyone's like pointing at your face being like, oh my God, what do we do about this? It's very, very disturbing. So that was the moment where I went, well, I had tried all these external things. And I realized that I just had some sort of epiphany where I was like, I'm gonna throw out all of these like medications and you know topical things and figure out what's going on internally because I believe that if I figure out what's going on internally, I can affect what my skin looks like on the outside. And I took this raw food class with this uh, really lovely black couple named um, uh, Eddie and Lillian. And they had a, a restaurant in Harlem called Raw Soul. And I learned how to prepare raw food and they were like, yeah, you just need to eat a lot more. We feel like you're probably, nutri you know, um, you have some nutritional deficiencies. Um, you need to eat a lot more raw food, blah, blah, blah. So I did that. And I also was like doing things for my gut health at the same time. Like I was consuming a lot of like, um, I can't even remember what that's called. I made this stuff called Rejuvalac that Ann Wigmore, I believe is one of the people who championed it. I was making that, I was eating all raw food and within mo one month I had no acne scars, no acne, nothing. My face looked exactly like it is. And I was like, wow, that's insane. But later as I became a practitioner, so I have this theory that the best healers have gone through crazy healing experiences themselves. But sometimes I pray to God to please stop my healing experiences because I have <laughs> I feel the exact same. I'm like, <laughs> I love like what I've gone through and I totally I have like gratitude for my journey, but okay, like universe, God, whoever, please, please stop. Exactly. <laughs> for me, it's like, please, baby Jesus, can I please not have any more healing experiences? So anywho, later I figured out that I had mercury poisoning. I started to get these really crazy um, food allergies, like food allergies to cashews, like, you know what I mean? Like stuff that I normally would eat and it'd be totally fine. And I went to a, um, a horrible doctor who basically told me that it was because I was vegan, that I needed to eat eggs or whatever. And I was like, that doesn't resonate with my spirit. How would I think about this? And then I just realized that I should probably go check out my mouth. And I realized that I had all these fillings from when I was a teenager and they were leaching into my body. So I got them all removed and literally the next day I was eating cashews. And then I had to go through the process of like detoxifying, like doing a whole mercury detox. But the mercury had damaged my system in several ways. When mercury gets into your gastrointestinal system, it can lead to candida overgrowth, parasite, which then leads to parasites or they both like each other. So sometimes you can have parasites and candida. So then I had to go through that child, which is a whole entire thing. But because I became a practitioner, I was able to order testing on myself, design my own protocols, which now I use on my patients. So anyone comes to me with candida, they will leave without it. I don't play around or mercury poisoning or parasites. And parasites can be so stubborn and so annoying because people have issues for years and years and don't realize that's why their sleep is disrupted or their mood is, um, you know, their mood is off. So parasites are the worst. And it's also really bad because the medical profession is not, um, people, traditional doctors are not trained to handle these nuanced gut issues. And so they'll do these, you know, colonoscopies and different things. And they're like, oh, we didn't find anything. Of course you didn't, because you, your testing is not up to date. It is not the testing that is going to tell you if someone has these things. Yeah, and sometimes like the big diseases like cancer, bowel disease, which is, there's a time and a place for that. But if you don't have that, you're just slapped with a label of IBS. Exactly. And then you're, they're like, sorry, you're good to go. And you're like, but I feel like I'm dying every day and I can't eat. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> So yeah, so I figured all that stuff out and then it helped me figure out, you know what I mean? It helped me figure out stuff for my patients. And then of course I could tell you a million and one other healing stories, but those are the main core issues that I overcame myself. So the vegan raw food diet got you to a certain point, but then you had to dig deeper. You, you didn't feel a hundred percent. You didn't just kind of put up with the symptoms like a lot of people do thinking that they're normal just because they're common. Um, so you dig deeper and you found, um, and like I see heavy metals, parasites, 
and trauma and stress, mold and environmental toxicity being like the real root causes of a lot of um, chronic um, chronic diseases and conditions. Definitely, definitely. And did you have any symptoms in your mouth when you had the mercury issues or is it more systemic? Because when I tell some of my clients to go to a holistic or functional dentist, they're like, I'm coming to you with skin issues or autoimmune or IBS. Like, why do I need to look at my mouth? And when I tell them it's the first part of digestion and dysbiosis or imbalances in the mouth are linked to things like cardiovascular disease now and sometimes fertility problems. So did you have any like oral symptoms or was it just that you had all of these other crazy things? Thank God I didn't. Um, I think that I didn't like keel over and die or have any horrible things because I was eating so clean. I think that my diet sort of counterbalanced it for a while. And then it finally just the ish hit the fan when the food allergies started happening really. Um, but I think that I saved myself because I think if I was eating a very standard American diet or, or fast food heavy diet and I had that mercury poisoning, I would have gotten very sick very quickly, but I kind of just stayed at this kind of like level of homeostasis that's not your best, but it's not your worst for a really long time until I figured out what it was. And now I feel really good because obviously I've gotten rid of those issues. And when some of your clients know what are some telltale symptoms or signs that they might be struggling with heavy metals, um, particularly mercury? Oh, that's a good one. Um, I mean, you just heavy, kind of test most people because of how prevalent it is. So what you need to, so usually if someone has a heavy metal poisoning, um, there, they may have other symptoms going on that then I, then that's what reminds me to ask about it. So if they have candied overgrowth, they have a white coating on their tongue. If they have a lot of no in, uh, nail and toe fungus. If they have, um, a lot of bloating after meals, um, those kinds of things. I, and, and then I, re, and then I test them for candida. I'm usually going to also ask, do you have mercury fillings? And they say, yes. And I'm like, we, we really need to get those removed. And I would just literally just have them go replace them. And then we'll do a mercury detox just in case. Right. But it can have crazy insidious effects, like on brain functioning as well. Um, there's a lot of things that can happen with mercury that are not pleasant. So that's the part that's tricky. It's not really like it's just one thing and then you run to go. It's more like if you have mercury fillings, save yourself now, get them replaced, do a detox and you will feel better. And you will also potentially prevent yourself from getting other health issues later. And uh, mercury fillings like the top exposure or the other places, like if someone has no metal fillings, um, are there any other places that we could be getting mercury from if they resonate with some of the symptoms that you just mentioned? I hope not. I, mean, I hope you're not playing with mercury on the weekend. Um. <laughs> <laughs> it's a huge issue, but sometimes my clients, they don't have them, but their parents had a mouthful of mercury right. and that can pass down as well. Um, and I'm curious what your kind of detox, and it's probably a little bit different for everyone based on other health symptoms um, and how sick they are, but what type of approach are we talking about? Because I know some heavy metal detoxes are pretty intense. Um, I like to kind of do more gentle things, but I'd love to know what you do it in practice. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a fan of gentle because you have to be very careful with how those metals come out of someone's system. So I use a combination of um, cilantro, chlorella, and usually, and it depends on the person. Like. Some people can handle eating more cilantro and then taking the chlorella pills, you know what I mean? But then I also support with things like um, NAC, N-acetylcysteine or vitamin C, um, just supporting the detoxification of someone's liver can also be helpful during that process. So sometimes having people do casserole packs can be great because it just helps in general with your organ functioning as it's trying to get rid of things, you know? Um, so really, I try to keep it pretty gentle. Um, I was able to, I think in my particular case, um, I did two rounds of my cleanse and when I felt better and it was kind of like a, a six week process. Because some people, they read online about heavy metal detoxes and they go on all these chelation therapies and IVs and just really harsh, intense stuff. And they wonder why they feel absolutely terrible Horrible. Right, the whole time. Yeah, it really, we can't be aggressive when it comes to detoxification from heavy metals. We have to be super gentle because you realize that this is still a toxin that you're unearthing that's then going to be floating around in your bloodstream and you really don't want 
you, you really don't want that because you're just going to feel tired, run down and increase the symptoms that you're trying to get rid of. And mercury is like one of the probably, I think it's like the second most neurotoxic thing out there. Um, no, seriously. They think that it's like it's completely safe inches from your brain somehow. Totally. And with some of these root causes, um, parasites, candida, rubber growth, heavy metals, how are they affecting hormones in particular? So this is the Hormones in Harmony podcast. Well, a lot of my clients, um, I work mainly with um, premenopausal women. So it's um, period problems, uh, acne, it's PMS, endometriosis, PCOS. Like how are these things um, contributing to hormonal issues? Yeah, well, hormonal issues are ag- exacerbated by inflammation in general. So if you have inflammation in your gut, you're adding to your hormone problems generally, right? Mm-hmm. Then you have the other issue with hormones in the gut where, and this I see in, in patients all the time, you know, people have, not, are, they're not consuming enough fiber um, to help their body excrete the excess hormones. And then they have high levels of the enzyme beta glucuronidase, which then just causes their body to recycle the estrogen, recycle the estrogen, and which fuels either fibroid growth, cyst growth, whatever, because basically all of the tissues of our body can respond. Um, In in the case of fibroids, it's the myometrial cells in the uterus, but basically in the state of estrogen dominance or too much estrogen flowing through, any of our tissues can respond by growing. So then we end up with things like cysts in our breasts, fibroids, um, et cetera. In the case of endometriosis, you get the thickening of the lining and it just, you know what I mean? So it's, um, it's really important. And I didn't realize how important until I started seeing so many hormonal balance ish, uh, patients. And I realized in doing research and as I got deeper into treating these patients that um, most of them had gut issues. So like, you can't ignore the gut at all, when you're dealing with hormones, you have to pay attention to what's going on. Are they consuming enough fiber? You know what I mean? Do they have leaky gut symptoms? Um, Do they have, because that's why inflammatory foods are not ideal when you're dealing with hormone balance. If you're eating a lot of gluten, in my case, I have a lot of African-American clients, 75% of African-Americans are lactose intolerant. Then you, if you're consuming a lot of dairy, this is how I saved myself. This is why I say I saved myself when I was a kid and I stopped drinking milk because I was lactose intolerant because most people continue consuming it. it their body treats it as an, as an inflammatory food. And then this contributes to some of their hormonal imbalances later, in addition to other things, but it contributes. And I spent so long just trying to tweak the hormones, like just lower estrogen levels and boost progesterone and all of that, like herb herbal medicine and things, which has its place and can help relieve symptoms temporarily. But then I was like having to rely on them in order to feel good and have clear skin and a normal period. But then as soon as I'd stopped taking them or strayed even a little bit on my diet, symptoms would come right back. And it was because yeah. I, I had heavy metals, candida, parasites, all of this yeah. that was still there. Um, yeah. I think step one with those things, especially heavy metals is avoidance. So there's no point yeah. in doing all of like the chlorella and all of that if you're still, if you still have a mouthful of amalgam fillings. So step one is always try to, as much as we can, because we're living in a toxic world, but if 90% of the time when you're at home, you can use non-toxic products, filter your water uh, quality, all of that, then it's going to help, but we can't live in a bubble, unfortunately. No, totally. And I'm really glad you talked about acne because that was one of my main issues. But my acne was also connected to the candida and the parasites, you see. And most people, when you go to acne, they're just like, oh, you should really just use this Accutane or use this, you know what I mean? Use this topical thing. And no one's thinking about acne like a warning sign, like something else may be going on internally. Sure. So for me, for when I look at someone with acne, I'm either going to see there's something going on with their diet. They're probably eating too many oils, too much dairy, too much, whatever it is, too many processed foods. That's one potential thing, but they also could have parasites. They could have parasites. That could actually be a real thing. And sometimes you get rash like acne when you have a parasite, you know what I mean? It's, it's different. It looks a little different. Mm-hmm. So it's important to kind of get to the root cause of these things, because we think we're, tr- especially when it comes to acne, because we think we're just treating it by putting stuff on our face. When literally it's like, this is a a clear sign that you're either hormonally imbalanced, your diet's a mess, or you have some sort of, you know, pathogen chilling in your gut. And I try to help my clients reframe that. And when I struggled, because acne was my 
first symptom. It was my worst symptom. It was the last thing to clear up once internally my body was good. And that often happens, doesn't it? Because the skin is not a priority for the body. You can survive with a face full of acne, but if your liver's messed up, your gut's not working properly, then that is like a life or death situation in some cases. So I try to reframe um, my clients with acne. Obviously we're trying to heal it, but in that process, seeing the breakouts as like a kind of the warning light on the car dashboard uh, when something is out of whack and the same with me now my skin breaks out on occasion but I know exactly why it's happening and it makes sense now whereas before it was just chronic random couldn't pinpoint a trigger but it's my body showing me what's working when I'm not treating my body right same with our menstrual cycle the period every month shows us how well or not we're taking care of ourselves so that we can make changes if we choose to listen to it rather than just suppressing and layering mm-hmm. on makeup to cover it up um because there are some people either that they're not in touch with their body or they don't have any obvious symptoms who just continue with their bad lifestyles and then down the line develop some sort of un- incurable disease or they drop dead of a totally. heart attack at 60 so i'm i'm thankful that my body is is very responsive and it shows me very obviously when things are working or not obviously it's annoying in some cases but I, I try to reframe it as it's a gift me. though it really is and mm-hmm. just like you're saying it's it's a gift because again you don't want to wake up 10 years later and be like oh where did this come from mm-hmm. you know yeah and acne in comparison not to kind of um, brush off acne because it is a serious issue especially for mm-hmm. mental health but compared mm-hmm. to some sort of cancer diagnosis it really is um something that can be resolved fairly fairly simply exactly, exactly. And one of the conditions that you mentioned, uh, fibroids, we haven't spoken about it much on the podcast. I have touched on endometriosis on a couple of episodes. I've done a ton on estrogen dominance um, and how to fix that. So that indirectly will help. But yeah, tell us a little bit more about maybe symptoms um, of fibroids, risk factors, um, and then the conventional versus holistic treatment paths. Well, I mean, symptoms, I mean, people, it depends on what type of fibroid there are. There are several different types of fibroids. There's subserosis, submucosal, submucosal fibroids are horrible. They cause abortive like bleeding. It's like almost like you're having a baby every cycle. Those clients are in the hospital when they have their cycle. It's bad. Uh, There's pedunculated fibroids, which are attached to the uterus by a stalk. Um, intramural fibroids. I think those are the ones within the wall. So there's all these different types. So it's important to know what type you have. And depending on what type you have, you could have different symptoms. I do have some clients with pedunculated fibroids because they're attached by a stalk, they can move. And some of them end up being really big. I had this one client have this huge one that literally kind of poked out of her stomach. So that's not fun. So sometimes people literally can see that they have like this pooch and they think that oh, I need to lose weight or whatever. No, no, no. It's literally something growing in your uterus that is now protruding from your stomach area, right? So you might have that. A lot of times people have a really bad cycle. So again, some fibroids can lead to crazy bleeding, like excessive bleeding, really long cycles. Instead of having like a, you know, a five-day cycle, they may have a two-week cycle. I've, I've heard crazy things in my office. Um, What else? Pain, obviously. Um, Some of these, again, certain fibroids are more painful than others, but some of these um, fibroids can also lead to like really horrible menstrual cramps around that time um, to the point where people need to be hospitalized or heavily medicated just to even like live life. Um, So it can be very debilitating. It's just, it's, it's really not ideal. And then of course, there's the problem of fertility when it comes to fibroids. And this is what a lot of my clients are struggling with is getting this diagnosis at a time when they're wanting to plan for a family and then realizing, depending on the location of it, is it going to be an issue? Um, You know, I spoke to an OBGYN early on when I started treating um, fibroids patients who definitely affirmed that it is possible to have a healthy baby even with fibroids. But the thing, the problem with fibroids and, and pregnancy is that we all know that when you're in the state of pregnancy, you have more estrogen running through your body. So you have, you run the risk that this fibroid could grow during the pregnancy at the same time as your, as your baby and either choke the baby out or get in the way of the baby as it's trying to go out through the canal, all kinds of stuff, right? So it really depends on the location and all that stuff. But I do wanna say that there is hope for people and it is possible. It's been affirmed to me that it is possible to have a child, even if you do have fibroids, it really obviously depends on the number, the size and location. 
So generally speaking, my clients, um, so fibroids are an epidemic for African-American women, unfortunately. And I didn't really realize how bad it was until I just, I wanted to just like weep in my office this one day because I was like, why am I hearing the same story from like 15 different people? And they're all like, yeah, my grandmama had a hysterectomy and my auntie had a hysterectomy and my mom had a hysterectomy. And I'm like, this is really, something is weird here. Like something's off here. And why is it disproportionately affecting black women more, more so? But the other thing that happens with black women, especially in America, is that they, that basically African-American women are offered invasive surgeries or very intense surgeries like hysterectomies more so than other races, which is very disturbing. And those, those surgeries cost a lot of money as well. So people are making money off of this, of course, but then you're destabilizing that person's entire body, obviously right? When they actually aren't even being offered alternatives. So when people come to my office, they've gotten to the place where they're like, literally like, I don't want to cut all of my ovaries out. I don't want to do this, this, and this. I, no one told me any other alternatives. No one talked to me about my diet. No one. And, and it's also not just first time. I've had people come to me and they've gotten the surgery. They've gotten a myomectomy before, uh, they've gotten a surgery before and no one talked to them about diet or anything then. And the thing is that if you were in a state of estrogen dominance then and no one corrected the things that led to that, they just grow back. So then they get to make money again off of you a second time when you got to go in for a second surgery. It's maddening. So literally they get to my office and they've either, this is their second time and this is the second time that they're dealing with this or it's the first time. And it's like, what do I do? I need other options. And it just became such a crazy recurring theme, but it started with one uh, client who's an actress who had endometriosis, who no longer has endometriosis symptoms. We worked for about seven, nine months. And that's what taught me it was possible. I was like, this is possible. We had to do all of the things to support her, to, to deal with the estrogen dominance. She went on a plant-based diet. We had supportive supplementation. She also used a pelvic floor therapist, which I recommended to help to actually reduce that lining buildup. And then she's, she's living her best life now. <laughs> she's literally like doing movies and stuff, which is amazing, um, especially because she was so young. So after that experience, it was like, okay, this is possible. I need to figure this out because there's too many people with this problem. So this is why I created a hormonal balancing academy because I literally had so many people calling and I was overwhelmed. And I was like, how do I do this in a way that gives people the education they need so I can get their mind right? So in month one, literally I go through and do lectures on diet, stress, holistic natural therapies to support the whole shebang. So you really understand what's going on here. And so you also understand when you go into your doctor's office, what to say no to, what to say not, you know, at least you're more informed because we get really scared in these situations and people just tell us you got to do it. The, the, your only option is a hysterectomy. And, and then you freak out and you're like, okay, I guess that's what they said. The doctor said this. So this must be true. When really there is a process you can go through and you owe yourself to go through before you get to, let me just do an invasive surgery of dealing with your diet dealing with stressors. And there's three different types of stressors. There's, I usually use the acronym DIE, diet stressors, internal, because stress kills. <laughs> diet stressors, internal stressors, um, environmental stressors, right? So all of those stressors, super important. Why? Well, uh, progesterone is the precursor to cortisol. So every single time I'm dealing with these clients who are, um, you know, we got a unique stressor of racism here in America. So I got black clients dealing with that. Then they got family stress, work stress. I mean, and then you were talking about things like xenoestrogens, like our plastic bottles and all the stuff, right? So we have all of this toxicity and potential stressors coming at us from all angles. And we need to figure out what are the ones that are triggering you and we need to deal with them. Because if we don't deal with them, you're gonna continue this cycle of hormonal imbalance that got you to where you are in the first place, right? So we have all of those things. We got to deal with the diet. We have to deal with the stress. And then we have to use supportive natural therapies to actually help. And that can be, for me, it's a combination of things that I use in my toolbox. I love casserole packs. I love acupuncture. I love essential oils. There's certain things and it really depends on the person, right? It depends on the person, but it's really important to get aggressive with those things first for a period of time. You'll be surprised. Literally people come and they're having debilitating cycles and craziness. And in two months, 
They're feeling so much better. They're like, I, my cycle just came and I didn't really even notice it. And the reason why like um, a lot of times uh, my, in my office, so it's a combination. Usually I'm, I'm trying to push people towards a plant-based diet if they are hormonally imbalanced. And that's just because I'm concerned about the hormones involved in some of the dairy and the animal products. And at that point you're already imbalanced. So I don't want you consuming anything that could keep you in that imbalance, you know what I'm saying? In that imbalance sphere. And I also don't want you consuming tons of sugar. Um, when we um, consume tons of sugar, we decrease the protein sex hormone binding globulin, which then increases the circulating levels of estrogen. So I got to get rid of the sugar. Um, and then of course, anything inflammatory, so gluten. So usually I'm trying to push them towards a plant-based diet. The, word, the, the most I'll let someone do if they really feel like they can't handle it is to consume some fish for the omega-3s. Um, but I need to regulate that person's diet. Uh, because that's one of the things that they're doing every single day that could be contributing to this. And then use the supplements, the supportive therapies, et cetera, to help them move down the, down the path. And what would benefits of a raw vegan diet be? Like when would you ask someone to take that next step? And Yeah. Well, so raw well, vegan diet is not for the faint of heart. You have to be mentally prepared to do it. But my friend, Dr. Baxter Montgomery has proven, and he's done research on his patients because he does a raw food diet all the time that in one month you can reduce inflammation in a person's body by 30%. That is a lot. So if you were really, even if you were just like, I gotta deal with this issue, let me go raw for one month and then let me deal you know, with these other things, can be helpful, but you have to also pay attention to whether or not that person's gut is out of a whack too, right? Because sometimes people can't handle the raw stuff with their gut issues. So it really depends on the person. If there's somebody who's really showing signs of hormonal imbalance, but they're, they're not having crazy bloating and whatever, then okay, sure. I'll put them on a raw diet, but maybe like you were saying, maybe I got to clean up candida and stuff first and they need to do cooked foods because that's a little bit more gentle. And then maybe they could do the raw afterwards or at least increase the raw, increase juicing, salads, all the fiber rich foods, but you have to pay attention to whether or not someone's going to have, because some people raw diets can be harsh for some people also because in Chinese medicine, as we know, um, there's a lot of Chinese medicine goes at things like fibroids. They call it almost like a phlegm damp stagnation uh, condition, which has to do with the heat of the body. So a lot of women who have fibroids um, are also very cold internally. So if you go to an acupuncturist, they will be doing things to heat up your system like moxibustion. Um, and even then, I also sometimes have my clients who are, I know they're cold internally and sometimes they'll even complain about it. <laughs> but you know, sometimes it's a combination of iron deficiency because they're bleeding so much and also the internal stuff. I'll have them do casserole attacks over that area to warm themselves up with the heating pad because the, the heat, the internal heat, and this is something that Chinese medicine understands better than everyone else is important for, for issues like fibroids. And interestingly, candida and yeast overgrowth would be considered cold and damp in Chinese exactly. medicine. Yeah. Perfect. That's exactly, they all, you see how they all go together because sometimes I think the problem with Western medicine, and this is why I'm really big on Ayurveda and Chinese medicine is because there's too much segmentation of this problem is separate from this problem is separate from this problem. But when I look at that macro picture, then I start to realize, oh, this is all connected. Okay. This person's really cold internally. So of course they're going to have candida and then they're going to have these gross. And then you see what I'm saying? versus it just being, okay, we have to handle each separate thing. And, and each separate thing has a separate diagnosis with a separate pill. And TCM and Ayurveda also show that we're linked to the environment and nature. And that there are answers out there, like plants provide us with the things that we need to heal. Yes, yes, yes. And another thing I will add to that, just because you brought that up, because I really feel, I th that's what I love the most about TCM and Ayurveda is the environmental, like you are in connection with your environment. But one thing I was going to say is that um, a lot of women with hormonal balance have issues with their sacral chakra, right? The sacral chakra is the seat of creativity. Um, and that's where um, emotions also a lot of deep emotional trauma can reside there as well. Um, playfulness, um, you know, so, so I noticed- Yes, and I noticed a lot of women with fibroids who come into my office have issues with playfulness expressing their emotions when they first start with us, you know, mm -hmm. there's, there's these things that are all, they're very obvious. 
And that has to be, and even just creativity, they might be in jobs or, or in situations where they're not expressing their, their true um, purpose or, or their true talents. And that in itself, and that's why I love Ayurveda and, and TCM because it takes that into consideration. Part of being healthy is actually working in harmony with what is, your purpose is. And we think that, oh, I'm just doing this job just, just for whatever, but it's like that job could kill you <laughs> over time. I've turned into the nutritionist where a lot of people quit their jobs or get new ones. <laughs> um, and I didn't mean to do that, but it's just that it's like you people realize Every time I go into work, I have a panic attack. That's not normal. Yep, you can't I shouldn't eat, be having- you can't just eat a raw food diet and expect to heal if you're stressed out and in fight and flight mode all day long. That's the thing, stress trumps diet. You could eat whatever you think is the most perfect nutrient, you know, rich diet and stress will erode all of the benefits. You will not be able to, to get any benefits from your diet. And do you help people overcome those like limiting beliefs or traumas or kind of energetic blockages? Or do you refer on to other people? I know you do like brain reprogramming so that people yeah. actually stick to the, the protocol that you give them. Cause you could give someone the information, but if internally they don't want to get healthy, they don't, they don't feel like they're worthy of health, then that's going to be an issue. Yes, totally. That's what I figured out. I figured out very early that people have subconscious programming that gets in the way of their self, their health goals. They can say that they want to be well, but internally, they might not feel that they deserve it because of things that happened to them, or they might have other thoughts that are competing. So that's why we integrate. So now in my practice, we integrate a very team approach. We have a dynamic change therapist. We have certified nutrition specialists. We have a naturopathic doctor, the whole shebang. But what I was doing at the very beginning of my practice, which now has kind of like set the groundwork for what we're doing now with this team approach is I would see the person figure out what was going on, be like, mm, that person has a lot of trauma or that person's been on 10 diets and clearly like something is going on between mind and like actual what they want to implement that if we don't deal with it, it's just going to lead to them being this being another diet for them. So I send them over to my dynamic change therapist. She's a clinical, uh, she's a clinical uh, hypnotherapist. And literally she does basically what I do with nutrition. She's getting to the root cause of what is causing some of these limiting beliefs in your life or causing you from getting these behaviors. She finds it, she goes back to the scenes, she reprograms those scenes, and then you listen to a recording for at least a month. And lo and behold, you're a new person. I mean, I tested this out when I was looking for something to get to the bottom of these subconscious things with my clients. And um, I did it as a test. I wanted to make sure she wasn't crazy and she changed my life. <laughs> She changed my life literally because I had so many like past traumas and things that I hadn't, you know, you can go to therapy for years and years and you still have not actually reprogrammed your mind. Actually, a lot of times therapy, unfortunately, sometimes will emphasize those neural networks because you're constantly talking about the trauma over and over again, which actually makes it stronger and actually makes the subconscious programming stronger, reaffirms it. So you really have to, un you need someone to basically undo that. And so that's what she does. So we have that as a part of our practice and I will never get rid of it because it's very important for certain people. A lot of my clients have been molested, raped. I mean, all kinds of crazy stuff. And they, you know, they feel comfortable telling me about this because I'm dealing with their health. But we have to deal with those kinds of traumas because they show up in other ways when it comes to our health. All of a sudden, now I've been molested. I've, I feel like I'm, I'm worth nothing. I also might end up, you know, a lot of people, um, I've had some clients with um, weight gain issues their entire life, but the weight is a protective barrier because they experienced some trauma early on and now they don't wanna be seen, they're hiding a bit, right? So unless we deal with that, how do we lose weight? How do you then yell at someone and tell them to do a diet? It just doesn't work. Another common one I see is like skin issues being like a physical mask because they don't express their true selves or they're embarrassed mm -hmm. about something. Um, mm -hmm. so I experienced the same thing. I used to think that I never had any traumas. Like I had a really good childhood, um, no like major issues happen. Parents are still together. Um, and I went through like, and with the health issues that I went through, I think that was a trauma in itself. Like, cause my health issues started around age 17, 18, which is when I was trying to like start a new job and go out with friends. Um, all of my friends were kind of going off living life and dating. And I was stuck at home sick with my parents pretty much every single day of the week. 
So that in yeah. itself was a trauma. I had to yeah. learn how to kind of overcome that. So and either energy therapies, I'm sure acupuncture helps with balancing the energies as well, but I totally agree. And I've seen people in therapy for 20 years straight and they're just going over the same thing and they're still triggered when something you're triggered up. and you spend thousands of dollars. So yeah. you can come to my practice and spend about $400 and we'll handle your business. Okay. You can go about your life. <laughs> so important. And I'd actually rather people start there um, yeah. than le- just t- perfecting the diet, taking all of these supplements, doing all of the tests because they're not going to get the results until they make that mindset shift. And often people leave it till the very last thing because Sometimes they, they get overlook. some results, but what yeah. happens is they will hit a plateau where their brain will be like, ah, I can't handle any more progress. Mm-hmm. And then they and start to backslide. Yeah. And that's where the results kind of catapult them to the next level. So totally agree with that. We're definitely on the same page. Um, and I don't want to finish the interview without talking a little bit more about racism within both the health and wellness industry and conventional medicine. So you gave an example before, but please educate us a little bit more about what is still happening. Well, I mean, it's really sad. (laughs) And I'm going to tell you about this from a personal perspective and a macro perspective. Basically, the things that I hear from clients and the things that research has proven is that African-Americans in general and African-American women experience things like misdiagnosis at a higher level, racial bias, um, dismissal of pain in in heightened situation. I mean, even Serena Williams almost died giving childbirth because the doctor didn't listen to her. Um, All kinds of crazy stuff. There's issues with, they've shown all the statistics that if you don't have a black OBGYN or a black doctor when you're giving birth as a black woman in a hospital, your baby has a higher chance of dying. Um, it's insane. It's crazy. And I can tell you that I literally have actually had more than one experience. I have one in particular experience where I could have died because of the way I was treated in a hospital. And the only way that I didn't die is I was sent home. And because I have doctors on my speed dial, I called someone who helps me the next couple of days or else I probably would have died. And so I've experienced it myself, even just trying to go get some simple care. And now I just, I just don't even, I, my biggest thing is there has to be more, a part of what I do is, is a part of the solution, which is there needs to be more credentialed health professionals of color servicing patients of color. So that's the first thing. Secondly, there needs to be training around racial bias, empathy. And I don't know why people need this training, but clearly they do. I don't know how you can see someone in your office and not empathetically connect, but I think that racism creates this barrier where now I am looking at you and you are not, you're not like my cousin or my auntie or my other, you're just that black person with a problem, right? And usually they're judgmental. I have clients tell me crazy, horrific stories about trauma, traumatic experiences they've had at the OBGYN or people telling them that, um, you know, oh, you must have an STD or, oh, like these weird, (laughs) weird ideas that come from pop culture, racism, whatever, about a general blanketed group, instead of looking at who is the person in front of me, this person has a name, this person has parents, this person has family, this person has friends, this person is suffering right now. Let me get to the bottom of what they're coming to to, to deal with. And, And the other thing that has to happen, which, this has to start from medical school because people don't get enough training. So when I was trained as a health professional, we had an entire course on healing presence, healing presence, where you have to listen to someone and you have to be able to embody this neutral, but healing perspective that allows that person to share with you all of the things that are happening. That does not happen in doctor's offices. There's a problem between inside voice and outside voice. Doctors say things out their mouth that they should really keep to themselves. Don't say to people, you only have three months to live. Don't say to people, you'll never have a baby again. It is none of your business. Unless Jesus told me that I was never having a baby again, you ain't got no business telling me that. You know what I'm saying? You're not God. So we need to stop with these, these statements because again, as we talked about the subconscious mind, these become very horrific things that can get implanted in someone's mind. And we know the power of the mind. Literally, if I believe that I only have three months to live, they've shown that I'm likely to die. Whereas somebody else who's like, mm, I'm going to ignore what he says. I'm going to get a sec- second opinion. Maybe I'll try some other stuff. They live longer. 
So we need to be aware of the power of our mouths in health, you know, in health environments. And then there has to be something done about, again, more health professionals of color connecting with, uh, you know, patients of color and then training and, and discipline as well in the event. Because I would tell my clients, and the thing is that it's so shocking for them and traumatic that they usually don't have time to, you know, find out about that person's license or whatever. But it's really important that we start to fight back. If you're in a situation and someone has treated you really horribly and you need a second opinion, write that person's name down, complain. They have a license. There are these, we need to start revoking the licenses of health professionals who actually do not care about all of their patients. You should not be a health professional if you're there just for credentials, for your ego, or for whatever else. You should be there to service the patients that, that, that are there for you. That, that's really your only goal. I mean, it's, it's bad enough for women just in general in conventional medicine, being told they're hypochondriacs, it's all in your head, you don't have um, any imbalances, any hormone imbalances, you're perfect, your blood works normal, go home, um, it's just that you're getting old, all of these things, but I can only imagine um, on top of that for Black women and how they struggle. And I'm really glad that you brought up just women in general, because I have another a friend who literally says, who said it was a good idea to ever let a man be an OBGYN? <laughs> And I'm not trying to hate on anyone, but I think she has a point. Yeah, you need to understand. Because of everything you just said. Yeah, you need to understand like what women go through in order to like with practitioners. Who made you the expert? So now you're telling me it's just I'm getting old, whatever. It's like okay, you have no experience on this. (laughs) So unless you, (laughs) and you know there are some good people. I'm nodding along right now. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, there are some good people out there, but I think she has a point in that. I think we need to, it's something, there's something about care. There's something about care from someone who understands your perspective that is different. And that's why I'm emphasizing that there needs to be more healthcare professionals of color dealing with patients of color. Because it's, again, there it's removing that bridge of like that person could be my uncle my auntie my you know what I mean? my my kid and hopefully i'm going to give them the energy that they deserve to actually get better because they've shown that empathetic basically getting non-empathetic care is worse than mm-hmm. than getting you really should just stay home yeah. if, <laughs> if you're gonna go deal with the doctor or health professional who's gonna like not really care about you it actually might leave more scars and, and do more for your stress, which would then do worse for your health issues. So you might as well just stay at home. And I think part of the healing of going to see a practitioner is them sat there listening to your story. They might not even have to say anything, but just feel comfortable to share your story. Like my initial session is 90 minutes and pe- women are like, oh my God, like you need to know about my childhood, like my parents' health. I'm like, yeah, it's part of the, the like, I've never, never had more than 10 minute appointment with someone to talk about my health. Yes, me too. My initial is 90 minutes too. Mm-hmm. Same thing. It's like, it's like a revelation all of a sudden, right? But when you come from our perspective, you realize how in the world are you treating someone in 15 minute appointments? Yeah, it's actually no breakfast. questions on diet or how's your stress level Nothing. sleeping at the moment. It's just look at the symptom, give a medication, which I know that some of them are trying to help get you out of the, the like give you some relief, but it's, there's no wonder that the medical system's failing. It's really, really bad. And they really need to be trained on questions, very simple questions to ask. I can't tell you the number of people who have come to me with a high blood pressure diagnosis, but it was wrong. And it was because no one asked them if they were dehydrated, did did they sleep that day, blah, 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 right? And it's like, they were just given a medication. And, And some people have white coat syndrome as well, where they get high blood pressure, just from showing up. So even questions like, are you nervous right now? <laughs> like, and then they start them on one medication and then they have to start another one because of the side effects. And then the at the end of the year on 10 different things that you're nobody's monitoring correctly. Like. And you have not promoted health. What? You and I are in the business of salutogenesis, which is the promotion of health. Everybody else can focus on their treating of symptoms, treatment of disease, the pathogenesis part. I'm interested in salutogenesis. So I'm like, how do I get this person well? and continue to improve their health over ter- over time. And I do think that medication has its place. I do think that there are some good doctors out there who have done the work to educate themselves. It's really just, we need to have a better system of working with, with these things from a holistic perspective and the Western medicine perspective to make it actually productive. And I think that most of Western medicine, unfortunately is obsolete. 
I do think it is very helpful for when people have, um, you know, emergency situations and you know what I mean? Very deep internal things, things that require- I say, if I get hit by a car, please take me to the emergency take, room, not an Don't take me to my Chinese medicine doctor <laughs> yes. if I get hit by a car. I will be at her, I'll they be at her office recover. every month. Yeah, they exactly. can do some acupuncture and help me heal, but I need life-saving surgery and drugs and painkillers, please. Exactly, exactly. So you see what I'm saying? So if we start to get to the place where we're training people that, okay, if I get my holistic health together, I'm not going to really need the doctor unless I have an emergency. Then I can focus on promoting health so I can do cool things like acupuncture and all this other extra stuff to make myself feel great. And then I can go and deal with my emergencies when the emergencies arise. But we need to get people to that place. And right now we've created a culture that's it's, it's creating more sick people, mm -hmm. basically. Yeah. And it's unfortunate because this in past entire year, we really should have been talking about how to improve people's immunity from a holistic perspective, which is all the things that we do, which is diet, nutrition, lifestyle. Yeah. You can't just take a pill. I know. You know? And in the UK, they've um, at one point recommended um, vitamin D and supplements and things, but yeah. there's been no mention of like metabolic health and getting outside. Like they've kept us inside which we can't get fresh air and vitamin D naturally through the sun. We're not seeing our friends and family. So then we're stressed out and anxious and there's because higher rates of suicide. Of and health, your community and your support. And I think that's, that was one of the biggest drivers of this entire year, which is like, we are humans. We are wired to connect with people and not just over Zoom. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's like, <laughs> it's like, if I only as soon as Zoom tells <laughs> us record this podcast right now, but yeah, I totally agree. We need in person, just we need in person. Exactly. And without that, we can actually become sick. They've actually shown there's a bunch of studies. There's a bunch of studies where like I did a, a podcast episode on partnerships and like, there was this married couple that does research together and they show that married couples in healthy relationships, like if the wife got a cut on her hand or something and she was holding the hand of her, you know, partner that she actually loved and they had a healthy relationship, she would heal faster than someone oh, wow. who was in a toxic relationship. It's a real thing. We There's need studies support. on like loneliness and being just as bad as smoking for your health. Um, yeah, they're trying to boost, they're trying to like talk about immune systems, but then they're keeping us locked away without seeing exactly. friends and family for over a year. Does not make sense. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Could not agree with more. I think we're definitely on the same page with all of this. And I think that was a perfect way to wrap everything up. But before we finish, I yeah. always ask my guests a few questions about you personally. So first one is what's something that you do daily to stay in hormonal harmony? Hormonal harmony daily. Um, I mean, I, my whole life is designed around hormonal harmony child. I do castor oil packs as maintenance for my like organs, like my liver and stuff. So maybe like once a month, it's not mm -hmm. every single day. Um, daily, I think it's just all of the things that I generally do. I worked out this morning. I drank my water this morning. Yeah, um, I probably don't feel like different things to you because they just become habits because you've They're, done them and you see the difference I have programmed so. habits that's exactly it i have programmed all of my habits to the point <laughs> where they will happen or i will feel weird basically so i think all of those things are really important for my hormones um me in particular i have to be really careful with the with excessive consumption of fat, even if it's healthy fat, it doesn't work very well. I'm carb efficient. I'm also West African. So it makes sense. We're carb efficient. I have to be careful because I love fat, coconuts, nuts, avocado. Very easy to overdo. Yes. And that will change the nature of my cycle the next time it comes around oh. if I eat too much of that. That's something I know about myself. And so these are things that, you know, learning your body is really important, but that making sure that I'm not over consuming fat and that I'm doing all my daily habits. I think those are the things. And that's just a perfect example of bioindividuality. Cause for me, my body thrives off healthy fats and not mm -hmm. so well on carbs. Exactly. So you see what I'm saying? Exactly. Mm -hmm. okay. And then <laughs> speaking of food, what's your go-to breakfast? Go-to child. It depends. It really depends. I mean, when I was just in Freetown, I was having a smoothie every single day, but it was so glorious because it was like market mangoes. I mean, the fruit in Africa is just like, 
I can't explain how good and organic the fruit sometimes feels. Like I can't eat a mango in the United States of America. It's disgusting. Um, so I was having a smoothie every single day with some, usually it would have either fresh coconut, meat and water, mango, pineapple, maybe a little avocado if I'm getting a little, a little testy there. Um, I have to be careful. Testing your limits a little bit. <laughs> Testing my limits. Mm, just a really simple smoothie sometimes. Um, I also was eating, um, strangely enough, I fell in love with Fanyo and they call it funde in Freetown and Fanyo is an African superfood that is high in B vitamins. It's kind of similar to like, um, it's similar to like a couscous, but it's really interesting because you can use it as a breakfast porridge and you could also use it as a savory dish or you could add it to a salad. And sometimes I would actually have funde in the morning with like some dates, some nuts um, and some sort of nut milk. And that was delicious actually. Um, and then here- I'll, I'll definitely have to do some research on that. Since yeah, like, no. like, kind of like quinoa. It almost looks like a key. Quin- it, it's the best part about it, child, is it cooks in five minutes. <laughs> if it's <Seriously>. easy. <laughs> no, like I became obsessed because it was like, it only takes five minutes. Like, look, it's done. <laughs> I thought it was a joke and then I did it. And I was like, oh my God, it really actually only takes five minutes. And can you get that in the US? You can actually get it in the US now in health food stores, thanks to a guy that I interviewed named um, uh, Chef uh, Pierre Tem. Um, he actually has a, a, a brand of Fonio, what is it called? Yolele Foods. I don't know if they have it in the UK yet, but they have it Probably in Whole not. Foods. Yeah, I have a lot of US listeners, so I'll try and find the link and put it in the show notes. Um, yeah, they have yeah, it in Whole really Foods now and in certain health food stores here. And then in West Africa in general, a, a lot of different countries in West Africa, but where I was was in Sierra Leone. They actually, they have Funde there. So mm-hmm. I, I could also get it there as well. Yeah. And I mean, if it's local, it's probably organic, even though they don't label it as organic. So it's similar to the fruit. It's not sprayed. It's, it's almost modified. too organic, child, because you also <laughs> have to worry about pathogens and stuff. You know what I mean? And True. So, yeah. <laughs> but you keep your immune system healthy with all the stuff that you're doing so that you don't get par- parasites as soon as you leave the country. Well, you have to be, that's the one thing that is really I feel like in general with our global world where people are traveling more, people need to be more aware of parasites and the precautions you need to take. It's really important to keep your gut in a state of health that if you were to get one, that hopefully your body would expel it as soon as possible. That's really the ideal. But if you know that you're someone who maybe doesn't have the strongest gut system, it's important to take things with you or have things mm-hmm. around. I mean, I'm medicine woman, child. So I have everything for my, my, so my like a separate suitcase, just with my pills. And Literally my- I had a, a suitcase full of herbs, essential oils. I mean, and then I'm glad I did because I helped some people get rid of malaria while I was there. Oh, you never know what yeah, you're yeah. going to run into. People laugh at you at first. Like my friends and family, they're like, Oh yeah. my God, can you just like chill a little bit? But then they're running yeah. to me when they get sick. Oh no, totally. No, totally. I had all the, I had the oil of oregano and all the stuff ready. I was like, oh, okay. You have a problem here. Take these pills. Like it, it's great. Healing the community. Exactly. <laughs> Love it. And then very last question is where can people find you online? Are you on social media? And if they want to work with you and check out your program, where can they do that? Definitely. So I, my website is therawgirl.com. If you go there, you can book a session with any member of our team, with myself, certified nutrition specialist, naturopathic doctor, um, the dynamic change therapist. We also have packages now and memberships where you literally get sessions with all of us, which is really, really cool if you're trying to address the health from all types of perspectives. Um, if you click classes when you're on my website, it will take you to stayingageusuniversity.com. That's where my hormonal balancing academy is. And that's also where my longevity program, it's called Staying Ageless 30 Plus. And that class is coming back again in September. We've had people reverse hypertension, reverse diabetes, get off of medications, all kinds of crazy, amazing, cool stuff. Um, And also just get their habits together. That's when I really go in on habits in that class. Um, You can find me on on the socials at The Raw Girl on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter, um, yeah. And I also have a podcast called staying ageless, um, staying ageless, and that's wherever podcasts are found. And that's weekly. Amazing. I will include all of the links in the show notes for anyone who's interested. I'm sure everyone has enjoyed this episode because I really have. And yeah, thank you for spending your time with us today. Thank you. Really appreciate it.